continuing our series on launch this morning, and I want to start out by reading you a little bit of a story, uh, not the whole thing because it, it'll take too long, but do y'all remember the story of Aaron Ralston? No, because y'all are too young to remember way back to 2003, but when I tell you this story, you're going to remember it. <clears throat> Aaron Ralston, back in 2003, was out hiking in the Colorado mountains. And he was gone uh, for a few days, and he jumped off a boulder, and he slipped, and his arm was pinned between an 800-pound, by an 800-pound boulder, lodged in there, stuck, could not get out. And for five days, he was stuck, pinned by that big boulder. So on the third day, he was out of food. He was out of water. And so he decided to do what, to me, I, I've, I read this story back in 2003. In fact, it hit me so hard, I made a copy of the story out of my Sports Illustrated and kept it in my files because it impacted me that hugely. He pulled out an old Leatherman type tool, the kind that you get, not like the real Leatherman, but the kind that you get with a $15 flashlight, like when you go to the auto parts store. And he took that thing out and decided the only way to save his life was to cut his hand off with a dull Leatherman tool that couldn't even shave the hair off of his arm. It was so dull. So he took off his bicycle shorts, put back on his shorts, <laughs> used the bicycle shorts as a tourniquet. And for the next two days, he cut through muscle and nerve and blood vessels. And then he had a problem. He had a problem because he was down to bone. Can you imagine two days and you get down to bone and then you go, huh, how do I get out of this? And so he decided to break his hand off. Yeah, I know, it's freaky. And so he broke his hand, broke the bones, cut the rest of everything off, and freed himself. And he, he said, I felt pain, but I coped, and I moved on. I'm like, I stubbed my big toe, and I want to go to the hospital and have, you know, like a cast put on it. I coped, and I went on. He was a Carnegie Mellon Honors grad for playing the piano. He was a former mechanical engineer for Intel, and he broke his hand off. I feel for Aaron Walston. He, by the way, then hiked six miles, got to the end of the trail, and found a couple from like New Zealand or something and asked for help. Could you imagine? Do do do. Oh, Colorado Springs is so beautiful. I love it. And this madman comes running up to you with bicycle shorts around his arm and says he needs help. I feel for Aaron Ralston. I really do. But I have a question. What's the first rule of hiking? Never hike alone, right? You don't go alone. You always take somebody. And if you don't take somebody, you leave a note on your car as to where you're going so people can backtrack and find you. Uh, I'm not diminishing in any way what Aaron Ralston went through. But if he'd hiked with a buddy, he wouldn't have been in that spot. My son Ben, back when we lived in Tucson, believe it or not, was a scuba diver. Uh, not in the sand. Go down to Mexico and you could scuba dive. He was also a rock climber. And my son never went diving or hiking alone. Not just because I would have killed him if he'd attempted it, but because it's always more fun to go with another person, or two, or ten. There's joy in the journey, and it's also much safer. And God has set up our journey with him the same way. He doesn't want us to go it alone. 
You go all the way back to the Old Testament in Genesis. Genesis 2 says, um, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. (laughs) Picture this. Adam is in the Garden of Eden. He had all of God all the time. 24-7, he was walking with God. And what did God say? It's not good to be alone. So even though we can have God all the time, 24-7, he still says it's not good for us to be alone. He wants us to journey with um, other people. Not just a spouse. It's not good for man to be alone. To walk without a friend a partner, a mentor, a life group. It's not good for us to be alone. And our passage in Luke talks about that very same thing. In Luke chapter uh, 10, verses 1 and 2 says, and, and this the Lord, oh, the, and this, the, after this, excuse me, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest fields. Jesus sent sent them out in pairs for a reason. He did not want them to be alone. First of all, the journey is much safer when you go with somebody. It's always better to hike with a partner. It's always better to journey with Christ, with another person. And it gave credibility to their witness and also gave them some protection from the evil one. The biggest reason, though, is probably it's not good to be alone. How soon would you give up if you had to do life completely by yourself? I'm an extrovert. I mean, sometimes I'm an introvert, but that's just to recharge my batteries so I can go and be an extrovert again. Um, I can't imagine not having someone to go with me to having to do life by myself. And I'm not just talking about my wonderful husband and my kids and my grandkids. I'm talking about y'all. Doing ministry alone is absolutely no fun. Sometimes we're called to do it that way. But God, his chosen way is to send us out with someone else. Jesus also sent them out to do specific work. Not just to wander around the countryside going, oh, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Here's a cookie and a pat on the head. No, he sent them out for a specific job to do. And it says in uh, Luke 10, 7, stay in that house. After you've traveled, stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker des- deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them of the, the kingdom of God is near you. So, there's, these three verses are really packed with great stuff. The first is, don't jump around looking for the perfect ministry. When you go to a town, go to the house and stay there. Don't be looking at other people's work and thinking, ooh, I want to do that. And then go, oh, no, I'd really rather go over here and do this. Oh, wait, what about if I go here? How much work have you got done for the kingdom? None, because you're jumping around. Jesus says, don't jump around looking for the perfect ministry, the perfect gig. Serve where you have been planted. So you want to settle in and get the work done. Don't go looking for the next best thing. God has already placed you in the best situation. Now, there's something that you need to know. God does not send you out without gifts, without the ability to do the work that he has called you to. Now, my two main gifts are preaching and teaching. And today, after today, you can decide if that really is true or not. But I'm hopeful that it's really true. (laughs) But sometimes God calls us to do stuff That's not in our area of giftedness. For me, a lot of times that looks like children's ministries. I love children. I adore my grandchildren who are practically perfect in every way because they take after their grandma. But it's not in my ballywick. It's not in my area of giftedness. So you know what God says? Do it 
anyway, and I will gift you for that specific job. Up here I have two tool chests, two, two toolboxes. This is ours. This green paint is from my son back in the day when he was building, um, oh, what are those called? Pinewood Derby, that's it. He's building Pinewood Derby cars because he was a Boy Scout, yes. I married an Eagle Scout and I birthed an Eagle Scout. It's pretty good to have it be Eagle Scout, I mean Cub Scout Day today. So um, he was building Pinewood Derbies and paint happens. But when God gives us a task, he gives us gifts. Now my gifts are not necessarily children's ministries, but you know what? I am a painter. I can paint a really straight line without the use of blue tape. Yep, I can. I can paint and I can refinish furniture and my favorite tool in my box is my electric sander. This baby rocks. You just put new, you just put new paper on it and you can strip it down to bare wood in nothing flat. Sometimes I get a little lazy and I want to use coarse paper all the way to really strip it down fast, but you can change it out. I love to refinish furniture. I've been doing it for years. I had a cedar chest that my grandmother got during World War II from my grandfather that was redwood mahogany. And then the 60s and 70s happened and she painted it. And she painted it gold and then went... I bet avocado green would be better, so she painted right over that gold. And then she went, no, I really want an antique white with gold fleck finish. There was about seven coats of paint on that baby when I got it. And because my parents were divorced and my dad was living in an apartment, for a number of years that cedar chest stayed outside. But it's okay, because it had seven layers of paint on that gorgeous furniture, and it made it. So I stripped that puppy down, and it is gorgeous. All I put was some varathane on it. It did not need a lick of stain. It is gorgeous. When my grandson was little, I should have brought pictures. You could come look at my iPhone if you want later. But when my grandson was uh, moving into his big boy room out of the nursery, um, I took an old white pine dresser that had red knobs and curlicues on it. So masculine for my grandson. And I stripped it down and I painted the body of it red and the drawer fronts black and the top black and then put diamond plating around it and long bars. And I'm telling you, it could be a craftsman toolbox. It looks that good. I, I, I was told I'd get to brag about that because it looks good. I like doing that kind of work. But sometimes God calls us to do work that is not in our area of giftedness. For me, it's preaching and teaching. When we moved here two years ago, um, I took the first year off of preaching and teaching because I, I had nowhere to preach and teach. <laughs> you know? It took us 10 months to find a church home because of Lou the dog. Lou the dog was anxiety-ridden, and the first time we came home from a church that we visited, the doorknob was pulled off of our door. And yes, she was in a crate locked in our bedroom. And she still bent the crate to you-know-where and got out and then pulled the doorknob off. And then when I walked in, I'm like, oh, good, she's here. Oh, Oh, not good, she's here. So we finally found Lou a new home, and within a couple of weeks, we found Rockbridge. And the first time we walked into this church, when we walked out, my husband and I said, this could be it. This, this probably is it. Then I got cedar fever, and six weeks later, we came back. <laughs> and after that second time, we knew that this was our church home. Well, my father got very ill last year, and he passed away in March, and my mom was suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia, and she passed away in July, and then two weeks later, my Uncle Johnny passed away from um, esophageal cancer. So in the space of five months, I lost an entire generation of my family, and my doctor said, you may not preach. You must take time off and get well. So I'm ready. I'm, I think I'm ready. I was not ready. Janet will tell you I was not ready. Ashley will tell you I was not ready. 
but I wanted to be, and I kept going, put me in, Jesus, I got something to say. Come on, coach, let me in the game. And you know what Jesus said to me? Have some plumber's putty. Plumber's putty, I don't do plumber's putty. I know how to use plumber's putty. I've used plumber's putty. I'm not a plumber. This is not in my area of giftedness. And Jesus said, work it, girl. And so I worked the plumber's putty, and I worked in the background. I discovered that I'm allergic to the stems on pumpkins by unloading the pumpkin trailer truck. (laughs) I worked the fall fest by walking around from place to place to place and replenishing toys in the buckets and encouraging people. I've rearranged rooms. I've prayed for people. The Lord did allow me to start teaching Sunday school, so I started teaching the pastor's Bible study. But he opened the toolbox and gave me gifts that I was not used to using and said, use these in the church. This is where I planted you. And it was good for me to rest and to do that. Sometimes God does that with you. For instance, I don't have the gift of evangelism. My knees knock whenever I'm sharing the gospel, and yet that's the greatest thing in the world to be able to do. You know, Josh Tidmore stumbles over a rock on the ground, and he goes, oh, do you want to know Jesus? And I'm like, ah. (laughs) But I'm still called to evangelize. I'm still called to reach into that toolbox and do something else. Now, my grandson has his own toolbox. And let me tell you, this does not have fake tools in it. These are not the little plastic or wooden handle things that you see in little kids' toolbox. This is his first real toolbox. He's got all kinds of stuff in here. He's got clamps, he's got pliers, he's got a real hammer. He's got screwdrivers that fit his hand perfectly. They don't fit my hand, but this isn't my toolbox. They fit his hand. So when God gifts you to do something, he puts tools in your hands and in your toolbox that fit you. Crew can use this toolbox. And he's always safety first. He puts his glasses on first. I love that boy. He was fixing something for his sister. Glasses were on. Screwing something in, but glasses were on. God gives us gifts that are for the job And maybe I will never need to be a plumber with plumber's putty again. But when I had to be, it was in my hand. So we're called to to hang out also and serve people who are work that we're working with and who we're working for and where they're at. We don't get to have people change so we can work with them. We get to work with people in their unredeemed state. I was going for a walk the other day, a couple weeks ago, and uh, I like to walk the cul-de-sacs because they're kind of uphill and I'm trying to get my staircases and fool my Fitbit into thinking that I've actually walked up and down stairs. And it does. And somehow in my one-story home, all 1,200 square feet, I've been able to pick up staircases. And I don't know, but I keep trying to trick my wrists so I can do it more often, but my wrists won't trick, so I'm just doomed. But anyway, I'm walking, and I'm going up. I'm, I live in Horizon Park, and I'm walking down Union, and I've gone up Grant, and I've gone up Lombard, and I've come down uh, MacArthur, and I take a right, and I go up Golden Gate, and there's a guy up in the corner in the cul-de-sac just about there who always has two or 300 pots of plants in his front yard, and he doesn't plant them in the ground because he wants to be able to move them around. So I've met his dog, Biscuit, before, so they're out in front, and I said howdy to Biscuit, and he, he came up for a little, you know, scritch behind the ears. And then the man walked up to me and said, hey, do you want to look at my flowers? Really? That's your line? You want to look at my flowers? But he was actually a really nice guy, and so he was showing me all his flowers and telling me everything, and I was getting ready to then go back on my walk, and I said, oh, by the way, my name is Aaron, and he said, I'm Calvin. We shook hands, and something flipped in his brain, and we were now best friends. I mean, he just decided that if he knew my name, he knew me, and he knew my uh, politics, he knew my beliefs. He knew my right-wing conspiracy theories. He knew it all. And Calvin flipped that switch, and Captain Potty Mouth emerged from Calvin. 
I mean, he said words that, I know, I grew up in San Diego where sailors live, you know, I know stuff. And on occasion, my nickname has been Pastor Potty Mouth, but that's a story for another day. But Calvin said things that I don't say, and I thought when he was talking to me, I thought, oh man, that's never going to leave my brain. Oh. So we get done with the right-wing theories, and I get ready to leave, and I'm walking down Golden Gate, and I said, I will never walk up this street again. I am not going up this street again. And as I'm going down Golden Gate, I hear this voice, pretty sure it was God, because it said, then who's going to be the hands and feet of Jesus in Calvin's life, if not you? So I said, okay, God, here's the deal. I'll come walking back up the street, and I will talk to Calvin, and I will engage him again, and I will agree with him that all medical professionals are evil and are out to steal his kidneys. I will, Lord. (laughs) But you have got to protect my mind from the words that are coming out of his mouth because I can't have those words living in my head. I can't. I can't. And God said, deal. Deal. And as I'm walking down, I kind of start going down Washington Square, and I get to the little cul-de-sac of trolley, and I realize the words were no longer in my head. And whenever they would pop up that day and the next day, I'd say, Lord, you got to protect my mind. And he has. So now I get to go back and talk to Calvin again, and he's always out when I'm out walking. So we, we minister where we're planted. We don't look for the better job. We minister to the people in front of us no matter who they are and what they're like, even if they're unlovely and supposedly unlovable. And you, you ought to meet Calvin. He's, he kind of looks like, a, I don't know, ZZ Top, but without the long hair, just with the beard. But finally... Jesus tells the disciples here to meet the felt needs of the people. Before you try and even tell them about Jesus, meet the felt needs. Felt needs are those tangible, physical things that people have to have met in their lives before they're even willing to listen to you. If you're hungry and I see you and I say, be well, be fed, good good on you, God bless you, and I walk on by and I don't feed you, are you going to listen to me talk about Jesus? No. Why would you? I've done nothing to help you except without the cookie, I give you a pat on the head and walk on. Jesus says we have to meet the felt needs of people in order to gain the right to tell them about Jesus. And that's why he tells us to go and plant ourselves in a community or in a ministry that we can, we can really minister to the people for a long time. I've been serving in the church since I was 19. I'll let you in on a secret. I'll be 62 in May. In fact, it's May 22nd. I live at 206 Marin Cove in Leander, and I love presents. So, anyway, so for the past 19, almost, when I was 19, almost 20, so for the past 42 years, basically, Um, I have preached, I've taught Bible studies, I've raised money for women's ministries, I've taught at conferences and retreats, I've been to Zimbabwe, Africa to co-lead a leadership conference. Um, But in all my 42 years of serving Jesus, I never felt like I was serving him more until I worked for an organization called ICS, Interfaith Community Services, which is a group of people in Tucson from various faiths, not all Christian, In fact, the majority of them probably aren't Christian. And we gather together and we try to meet the felt needs of Tucson, Arizona. I drove seniors to their medical appointments and to Trader Joe's because they needed a ride. But my favorite, beyond all favorites, was I got to work in the food bank. I loved working in the food bank. I loved it so much that I would get up and get at the food bank between 5.15 and 5.30 on a Monday morning and help do whatever we needed to do in order to open up by 9 o'clock. I served people bread and food and macaroni and cheese and vegetables and meat. And I talked with them and I laughed with them. And some of them asked me to pray with them. 
And so I prayed with them. And then with my team of volunteers, I, I loved them. I was challenged by them. I challenged them. We laughed. We cried. We solved the world's political problems. We, it was just, it was a time of pure ministry. And yet the entire time I worked for ICS, I was using my plumber's putty. Not the gifts that God has specifically gifted me, but the ones he put in my tool chest and said, use these. We need to be able to meet the felt needs of people in order to minister to them. So I want to encourage you, along with Luke, to go into the ministry. Maybe you're not comfortable in that ministry. Go anyway. We got some folks going to Guatemala soon. Guatemala is not a comfortable place to go necessarily. But God is equipping them, some within their gifts and some without their gifts, to go and minister to those people. He's encouraging us to work together, to journey with others, and to serve and to persevere in the work God has called us to. I mentioned that I went to Zimbabwe in 19... 97, so some of you were not even born yet, I get that. Um, I was the director of women's ministries at a very large Southern Baptist church in Tucson, Arizona. And when I was hired 10 months before this trip in March of 97, I was told, your big ministry event is you were going to find a team of women, you're going to raise $25,000 and you're going to send that money ahead to Africa, and then you're going to take this team of women that you don't know, have never worked with, and you are going to train them how to be short-term missionaries, and then you're going to get on a plane, and you're going to fly to Africa for 10 days. I wrote my resignation letter. I did not. But um, God placed on my team women with various different gifts. Their toolboxes look different than mine. My ministry assistant at the church was a woman named Karen Schelt. Karen had the gift of, of administration like nobody I have known, except maybe my husband. And she got all the tickets and all, made sure all the passports were, she did everything to get us there. All the hotel reservations, everything. And then I had Gretchen, Mary Beth, Jan, I'm missing somebody, um, Gretchen, well anyway. That's terrible that I can't remember. Um, I had this team of women that we went, all six of us went, and served Jesus together in Africa. I learned a number of things. I learned that I love teaching. It doesn't matter who the audience is. I love it. I learned that one-on-one -on -one ministry touches people's lives way more than my words up here but walking alongside somebody can make a difference in their lives. I learned to stop every day from what I was doing and have tea. And I learned that milk and tea is delicious. I learned all of that in Africa. I really had to open up my box. There were places in Africa that you don't walk without a friend. So we never went out by ourselves. One time Mary Beth, or I'm sorry, one time Gretchen was going on a run and she heard click, 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 and had all these guns trained on her. And she says she stopped and she backed up and Mary Beth, who was with her, said, that's the palace. We're not allowed on this street. Mary Beth and Gretchen went back away slowly. Gretchen didn't see it. Mary Beth saw it. Go with a partner. Go with a friend. Use your different gifts and learn how to be the hands and feet of Jesus outside of your comfort zone. I want to encourage you all this week to go out and make a difference. Grab a friend and go out and minister in a way that maybe you're not even comfortable with. Grab your toolbox and a friend and change the world this week. It's what Jesus has called us to do. It's what he wants us to do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.